Hello, and welcome to our virtual farmer shop talk series. I'm your host, Amanda Gumbert, an extension specialist for water quality at the University of Kentucky. You are viewing the second of four conversations originally conducted in winter 2021. This virtual farmer shop talk series was an opportunity to have meaningful conversations with farmers and experts about practical ideas and programs that can help you weather hard times and have success with stewardship practices on your farm. We thank you for viewing this recording and hope that this interaction leaves you recharged and sparks new ideas that are applicable to your production system or to those whom you serve. This virtual farmer shop talk series was developed by a dedicated project team who work across the Mississippi and Atchafalaya River basins at different land grant universities. With funding from the EPA Gulf of Mexico Farmer to Farmer program, we have a long-term vision of improving farm sustainability and protecting soil and water resources. We also recognize the many challenges and sources of stress for producers. And while there are many risks and challenges on the farm, we know that there are producers who are methodically making calculated changes to their production systems in ways that are supporting their overall profitability and sustainability. While we had planned to be having these conversations as part of an on-farm field day, we are excited to offer these farmer-focused interactions in a virtual platform. We hope that you find these conversations as meaningful as we did and that you leave each session with at least one good idea. Today's speakers are Mr. Tony Pyrrhic, a Wisconsin farmer, Mr. Dale McKeel, also a Wisconsin farmer, and Dr. Josh McGrath, a University of Kentucky soil management specialist. Dale McHale has been farming since graduating from UW-Madison in 1972. Um, he and his son, Jonathan, grow corn, soybeans, and winter wheat on 2,400 acres. They started growing covers after wheat and have expanded to growing covers now on about 80% of their crop acres while switching to as little tillage as possible. Um, so mostly they're in a no-till and planting green system. And if you don't know what that means, I think they are probably going to explain that to you. Um, Dale had worked with UW-Madison uh, Discovery Farms from 2015 to 2018 on a nitrogen use efficiency project, and he's now doing his own nitrogen plots with the help of his agronomist. Um, so that's Dale. And then Tony, um, Tony Perrick is the president of the Dodge County Farmers Healthy Soil, Healthy Water Group. He's a partner in TNR Dairy Farm near Watertown, Wisconsin with his brother Ralph and their two sons. Their dairy has 200 dairy cows and 1,100 acres of corn for grain, silage, um, cor I'm sorry, corn for grain and silage, soybeans and forages. Tony's been experimenting with cover crops for about 10 years and planting green for the past five years. His farm also does custom spraying and harvesting as well as planting cover crops for his neighbor um, and his neighbor's farm. So I think you can tell these fellas are pretty busy. So thank you all so much for being here and I will mute myself and you guys take it away. Move to the next screen. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Okay. My name is uh, Dale Mahale, and um, as Amanda said, we farm in Wisconsin. We're in the northwest corner of Dodge County, and um, starting in 2015, uh, Discovery Farms invited us into a nitrogen study with them. It was a three-year program, and they essentially came onto our farm and did most of the work. Um, we did some uh, reduced N, zero N, and our regular N studies side by side. And then they came in and at first did the yield checks. And during that time, during that three year period, I also belonged to our, our uh, healthy water, healthy soil group. And we were switching our tillage more and more towards less tillage, finally to no-till and using cover crops and planting green. S 
So um, our current management for nitrogen involves broadcasting our nitrogen before planting at about 45% of our yearly usage. And we do that at a straight rate. And then we do 10% of our nitrogen at planting, it's in furrow. Um, and that nitrogen actually comes from uh, ammonium sulfate and DAP. And the balance of our N is applied as a side dress spinner when the corn is about 10, 20 inches tall. And that application is done with a variable rate on prescriptions. So depending upon what we feel that field needs, we will be changing the rate of N. While we're side dressing, if our prescription calls for less than 100 pounds of product, we probably will go back, have that thought out ahead of them, reduce our first rate because we do not want to put on less than 100 pounds because our, our spreading unit loses accuracy if we try to lower that below 100 pounds. This is a chart showing some of the uh, nitrogen rates from the uh, Discovery Farms calculations. This is uh, the first two, three years of the program. Um, this particular field, uh, this test strip was on a field that was in its fourth year of corn. Um, we were surprised that we could grow 200 bushel corn with 105 units of N less than our normal rate. Um, and adding that 105 units, we increased the yield 21 bushel to the acre, which still made us some money, but showed that we were probably leaving some N unused in the soil. And at, the, uh, at just our starter rate of fertilizer with no other added nitrogen, um, as you can see, we took a yield hit there, but um, of course our efficiency went way up, but um, I'm not sure that's where we wanna go really. So at this point, we're just learning how to use our N and our farms better. But like I said, this was a field that was in its fourth year of corn. This chart actually shows the rate over um, our Discovery Farm project for three years. And as you can see, we are all over on this chart. We're at both ends going up, um, which shows that every field is different every year. Um, it depends a lot on your previous crop, even the yield of the previous crop. And it, depends upon moisture, it depends on heat units, it depends on whether you had a cover crop, manure, whether you're planting green, when your cover was terminated, whether you're doing no-till, tillage, whether you had legumes in your cover crop. There are a lot of variables here that we were trying to sort through on our farm, which we wanted to use. What we hoped to learn was to be able to predict when we could reduce our end use without sacrificing yield. This next slide is um, one of our test plots that we did in this past year. Um, it kind of shows the system and how we did it. Um, we're using variable rate on our second application with a spinner. And then we had uh, the rows E, F, G, and H were like uh, check blocks to see what, if they varied, like from A&E, what they varied across the field. Um, and as you can see, the different rates didn't really put out a lot of different yield. Um, and this field happened to be following soybeans and it was planted green. So it was no-till following soybeans, which kind of explains why we didn't see as much variation when we dropped the units of nitrogen. This, these also were done in 2020. Um, the top chart was from a field that in 2019 was prevent plant. We had too much moisture in 19 and we had with crop insurance some fields that never got planted. So this particular field, we had 
put a cover crop in in June. And it was a uh, mixture of crimson clover, radishes, and we had a little bit of annual ryegrass put in there. And it was planted in June. So we got a lot of growth on that field. Um, we even had some water hemp come through and uh, my advisor kind of wanted us to spray because he was worried about the water hemp, but I did not want to kill the cover crop. So we just went in there and clipped off the water hemp and it did not seem to be a problem in next year's corn. Um, and as you can see, even at the starter rate, our yield was very good. So being that cover was there most of the summer with a legume, there wasn't a crop harvested off that field. We really didn't have to need any end in that particular field. Now on, a, on the field below that, that was that same field I talked previously about. Um, and that was after soybeans planted green with annual ryegrass as a cover. And as a side note in that particular field, I terminated the rye shortly after we planted, or I should say attempted to terminate. When I came back to visit that field, I found out that our kill was not very good and the rye was about a foot and a half tall. So I had to make an emergency spray to kill off the rye. But if you look at the yields, I don't believe it hurt us much at all. Um, the corn probably was just maybe an inch tall when I sprayed the second time. So moving forward, we can, um, what we have learned is that with cover crops following small grains, we can really reduce our nitrogen use. Also planting green, moving into soy, I mean, moving out of soybeans, we can also reduce our nitrogen, maybe not as much as the small grains, but we can still reduce our nitrogen. Um, so we're actually using that plan in our prescriptions now. So if we have fields following those particular crops, we are reducing our end use. And moving forward for the coming year, we're gonna do some more plots and I'm gonna let my crop advisor explain how we're gonna do that. Yep, hello, uh, Philip Lotch here, uh, stepping in uh, on Dale's uh, presentation. So I just wanna go through a little bit on, on what we're doing, uh, what the farm is doing. Um, so this slide, I don't know if I have a mouse that moves here, if they can see that. So we've got a whole bunch of different check blocks that are set up. Uh, so Dale's farm's got uh, 16 or 1700 acres of corn. And in 2020, we did, uh, we did 50 check blocks, um, uh, like what we have with these squares. We're checking, we're checking blocks compared to the blocks itself. And then we're checking blocks compared to uh, some of the regular rates that we would do. So there's a ridge that runs through this uh, field, through this farm. And this ridge is, uh, uh, we've already reduced our nitrogen going up on top of the hills, being that our limited uh, yield limit restriction is gonna be lack of moisture on those hills. So we've got that built into it. So when we're doing these variable rate um, applications, we're doing them on, on flat areas on, on uh, uh, the best we can. Um, if, if we're going to do this, we got to have this set up in advance. We should have two week, uh, two months. We should have this done two months in advance. Uh, that way, when you know, we don't, we don't have to go out. We don't have to set flags for the growers. Uh, be there when they're spreading it. And if we're doing fifty of them, let's say just on this farm, uh, we should be doing more on other farms as well too. So let's get this set up in advance. Um, well in advance, uh, the same thing when it comes to combining. So we can use the yield monitor, we can look at field view. Pioneer has one, John Deere has one, Egg Leader has one. You know, there's a bunch of them out there, but we don't have to look at them the day after. We don't have to be there when they're actually combining. Uh, we can go you know, two months after the fact, uh, go back and look at that information. So if there's, uh, if there's crop advisors that are, that are out there, I, um, I would offer this you know, offer this as a service to your growers and just say, if you're already writing seed prescriptions or line prescriptions, potash prescriptions, uh, let's just work this into uh, nitrogen as well too. And one last, um, you know, we, we wanna make this easy, fast for the 
growers, we, we want them spreading fertilizer at the same time, combining at the same time. We don't want any, we want to limit the amount of restrictions that we have when people are out, when their farmers are actually uh, doing that work. And one question I'm going to throw out to the group, uh, but uh, let's not answer this till at the end, because otherwise I'm going to cut Tony on short on this time. But uh, maybe there's somebody out there that's already doing this on a Zoom call and uh, uh, just speak about what you got for your experiences on that. So I'm going to turn it over to Tony. Okay. Just click it. There you go, man. Oops, that isn't coming up, Jerry. Here, let's see once. Did it again. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Tony Pyrick. I'm the chair of Dodge County Farmers Healthy Soil, Healthy Water. Uh, I've been working with uh, the Discovery Farms too, also for the three years on ENUE, uh, and also our private crop consultants over the years. I've done a 10 year nitrogen uh, study for the university. I'll show you some slides on that after a while. So, like I say, our, our farm established in 82. We're 200 milk cows. We're milking. It's a family farm. We keep it all in the family. We have run 1,100 acres right now, uh, and we do a lot of custom work of planting and harvesting and spraying. Uh, my current nitrogen program is 120 to 140 units of N, where corn on corn, and then uh, about 80 units when I'm uh, doing corn after beans. Uh, as you see in this picture, I was in 2019, I was planting into cereal rye. We had a late planting, so I do plant green. This is the maximum that I planted that year. And i uh, show you that it did, it did head out that year we were planting into cereal rye. And when I do that, planting green, I do move 60 units of N up at the uh, planting time because the cereal rye, I'll show you in a slide later, does uh, uh, absorb and uh, uses and takes the nitrogen out of the ground and keeps it in the plant and then removes on later. So, oops. Oh, let's see, nutrients and cereal rye. Oops, it's not coming up here. Oh, there we go. Okay, the nutrient cycle and cereal rye I was talking about. Uh, Rick Clark did this. I can show you some of the nitrogen that it actually pulls out of the ground, the cereal rye. When it's 12 inches tall, cereal rye will, will pull up about 82 units of, he's done this on a, he, he will take a, a two foot square, harvest the biomass and have it analyzed. And this is his, uh, is analysis of the cereal rye as it's growing as we plant green into it. So at 12 inches, there is uh, 82 units uh, and um, at K2O is at 76. So you can see the where the nutrients are coming up in the plant. At uh, 18 inches, it's uh, 120 units of N is in the plant and the 0060 is up to 213 from 133. So you can see in a matter of, it's a matter of a week it's roughly at a weekly uh, times is when he pulled up these uh, analysis. At 28 inches, it's 134 units of actual nitrogen in that plant that's pulled up and 281 units of potash. So, and then after it de decomposes, he's done a test after decomposition, you can see that it did give it back a lot of the nutrients. And that's where we're able to see the benefits of using covers and using cereal rides to sequester our nitrogen and stuff in the ground and give it back to the plant as we need it. So uh, my nitrogen, I did uh, so years ago when I was uh, doing a lot of planting corn always, uh, we have a private crop consultant also, and I always argued with them that we didn't put enough nitrogen out. You know, we should be putting more nitrogen, more nitrogen down. So this is uh, for 10 years, I did this rate uh, trial it was uh, three reps in the field, four different uh, App, uh, rates and uh, multiplied by three times. So it was done and we weighed everything with uh, weigh wagons and everything was done by weight and uh, amount went up went on. As you can see, the nitrogen rates at zero was 162. We did have zero rates out there and uh, we had the, we roughly at what 58, 85, 145 and 188 units of nitrogen. And this plot here, uh, what I'm showing you here was uh, after soybeans. So at uh, zero rate, we got and that was just, uh, we did have the starter on there. So you do have the units of starter, which was there. So it was 162, 58 units of uh, N was 192 at 85, 209, 145, 213, and 188, 218. So we were over applying a nitrogen. We knew that all the time. We have to back down. And, uh, and this is all side dress. So I put some on at uh, planting and also we always side dress everything at, uh, when it's needed. So you can see 
what where our most profitable rate was was at 209 bushel an acre at 85 units. This was uh, corn after soybeans. And uh, so the profitability was there and not throwing the extra nitrogen out. And at that point too, our extra nitrogen is going down the ground. That's where we got our nitrates problem. So it was a very, very good uh, trial we did for it. And it was repl it replicated almost every year consistently. We didn't ever saw that variable that we needed to put more than at 85, you know, 80, 85 units of nitrogen after uh, soybeans and 120 to 140 units of nitrogen and corn and corn get their most profitable area of, uh, of uh, yield. So here's our NUE strip showed how the different uh, areas respond to the nitrogen inputs. Uh, you can see we were some of the higher ones in there where it was. As we continue to improve health, we'll consider scaling back nitrogen fields. Uh, that's one of the things we were working with, especially with planting green. I've been planting green now for quite a few years. I've been no-till for a long time. Uh, we're going to see more availability of our nitrates in our soil by using covers and uh, the covers sequestering the, the nutrients out of the ground over winter and giving them back to the plant the next year, you know, and your grain and everything. So we do know that the uh, Cover crops are very beneficial in trying to reduce our nitrate problem and uh, taking the excess nitrates that's in the ground over winter and holding it for the crop for next year. So then you need to evaluate nitrate management after rye crop this year. So you can see uh, the additional nitrogen applied took up 98 pounds of nitrogen as was possible. You can see the rates here where we applied the yield and the test strip with no uh, extra nitrogen applied just to 40 pounds at planting. So you can see the total end intake grain versus stalks. So rye can scavenge in a lot of the end and hold it on for residual and give it back to the plant later. So, uh, and here's a plot I did this year, last year. Uh, you can see the, just adding the different, I had a zero, zero rates are on here with no side risk. It was just at what I planted, uh, had with the planter and, uh, so you can see this is replicated three times by adding the extra 32% at different rates. And I've been putting some stuff on with uh, Midwest BioAg. It's a molasses, I use a molasses starter for the last seven years now. And I believed in that, uh, I put that with 32% and the molasses is, uh, it feeds the biology. We need to feed biology in the ground more so than put the fertilizer in the ground. And if we can feed biology, biology will help bring the fertilizer or the nutrients up the, the plants. So as you can see the adding too much nitrogen, a lot of times we're not getting our rate of return and you're just having uh, our nitrate problem. That's a lot of the problems we got out there. Everybody's applying too much, too much nitrogen. And they won't cut back as you can see in Dale slide too, how much by just reducing our ends and the yield we can get by reducing and uh, not worried about the high yield versus the rate of return. So what is the value anyway, uh, university and anyway, both show me that I can reduce my end rates by getting similar yields. So I got to give a lot of uh, credit to the discovery farms. I worked with them for even before the NUE plot, we got involved years back when they first started on different runoff problems and that, but their NUE program has been very, very beneficial to show the farmers that uh, we can cut back on nitrogen and uh, we can get some decent crops and we don't have to be over applying nitrogen because there's just so many farmers that want to over apply the nitrogen figuring that's what we need out there, but it needs to be applied at the right time, side dressing, and uh, you're going to get the most beneficial will we'll reduce our nitrates that we have in the ground. So, and cover crops are very beneficial for uh, sequestering the nutrients and uh, pulling up the nitrogen that's left in our fields over the, after our crop comes off because a lot of times their nitrogen isn't completely used up and using covers and cereal rye makes a big difference. You can pull up the nutrients out of the ground. So with that, uh, I wanna thank you for inviting us to talk about this. We can have question and answers later, but uh, these programs are pretty beneficial nowadays for our uh, nitrogen and nitrates for the problems we do have out there. And I gotta give Discovery Farms a lot of credit for that helping us out. So with that, I'll turn it back and uh, we can go further. Dale and Tony, thank you both so much for sharing your experiences and how you've been um, interested and willing to try different things on your farms. I know it could probably be a little nerve wracking to 
under a, what you may be perceived to be an under application um, and hope that you get the yield response that you want. Um, if while you all are, um, you can stop sharing your screen, um, Dale and Tony, then we can, um, I'll, we do have one question though for you um, in the chat box. Adam Braun is asking if you can comment on how much credit you get from manure and what your soil organic matter is. So while you all answer that, I'll let Josh go ahead and share his screen. They'll I'll be busy. Yeah, well, we, we do test, I, we test our manure all the time and we do, uh, we'll use the values of the manure. Our organic matter has been increasing over the years with the no-till, I've been three to 5% now, a lot of it, but I've noticed in all our, we test every three years on soil tests with our crop. And uh, I've been noticing with no-till and covers, our organic matter has been constantly increasing, but we do, like I say, I, we got a liquid manure system. Uh, we do try to not over apply uh, manure, which we never go over much more than 7,000 gallons an acre. Uh, we found out, uh, which is true, that over applying manure can kill your biology and your soil. And if you want to apply that, you can apply 7,000 gallons at different times during the year, but not this 20,000. It's overwhelming the system and you're, you're hurting your microbes in your soil. So that lower rate of uh, manure is very beneficial. But like I say, basically you want to get your manure analyzed and, and uh, try to use that too also in your, in your plans, not uh, just throw the manure out there and not worry about what's, what the analysis is. So. Yeah, thanks, Tony. I appreciate that from a nutrient management perspective. We always try to get our producers to do that as well. Um, okay, so next up, um, um, Josh McGrath is going to speak to us. Let me get your, um, let me make sure I say the right things about you, Josh. Um, so Josh McGrath has served as an extension specialist at the University of Kentucky since 2014. And prior to that, he was at the University of Maryland um, for, from 2006 to 2014. And so his integrated research and extension programs really focus on developing, teaching and implementing management practices that increase farm efficiency while protecting natural resources. And um, Josh speaks routinely uh, throughout the US and internationally. And I think he has spoken with um, Wisconsin Discovery Farms before as well. Um, so without much further ado, um, Josh, I'll let you take over. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, are you looking at the right screen for me? The big, the big slide. Yes, I am uh, your first, your first one. So I'm going to make a confession here. Uh, I wasn't going to have any PowerPoint slides and Amanda said, well, maybe you need to have a couple just to kind of introduce yourself. And then uh, I got so excited by what Tony and Dale were saying. I just threw out the presentation that I sent Amanda that I was going to use. And I made a new one while they were talking uh, to try and respond to some of the issues that they brought up. Uh, really uh, interesting stuff you guys were sharing. Uh, that's one of the reasons I really love the, the Discovery Farms program. I've gotten to speak at a couple of different Discovery Farms programs and, and that kind of on-farm um, partnership with, with farmers is just, just tremendous. I love it. So, um, so hopefully I don't make a complete fool out of myself since I just put all these slides together on one screen while I was trying to listen to what they were saying on the other screen. Um, that's always, always dicey. So let's see if this works. I was just grabbing slides from other presentations. So, you know, when we think about nitrogen, and so I was going to talk about manure. So I'll say that up front, that, that my, my first uh, set of slides was on manure. And I basically dumped my manure slides and I went to some precision uh, nitrogen and phosphorus slides because that just uh, kept kind of coming up in what Dale and Tony were saying. And so when I think about precision nitrogen management, I think about George Stanford in, in 1965. And, and recently, a, a lot of my colleagues at the land grant universities have been critical of quote unquote Stanford's equation or the old rule of thumb 1.2 pounds of nitrogen per bushel. Uh, but I think that comes from a place of kind of mis misrepresentation or misunderstanding of what, what Stanford was saying. And, and in 1965, he said in his paper, he said, if we don't move away from our empirical nutrient recommendations that we make as scientists towards mechanistic approaches, um, we will never gain precision in our nutrient recommendations. And so if we think about our current recommendations, uh, whether it's phosphorus or nitrogen, they're really accurate. And sometimes I hear people say, I wish we had more accurate nitrogen recommendations or more accurate phosphorus recommendations. But I think, you know, we've done a lot of research to demonstrate they are on average. So what accuracy means is on average, they're right. And it doesn't matter whether I'm talking about the MRTN approach that the Corn Belt states like Wisconsin and 
and uh, and Illinois and Indiana and, and Iowa use, or if you use a yield based approach where I came from in Maryland, there are, those are all empirical approaches and they're all very accurate. If I take 20 years, if I did 20 years of studies on your farm uh, with a bunch of different nitrogen rates, the average right rate would be what the university recommends. They're built to be accurate. But in every year and every field, that recommendation is wrong, right? And every spot within that field. And so, so Stanford was saying, let's look at the mechanisms. Let's look at the components. And empirical uh, research is like, let's put out a bunch of rates and look at that response curve over a number of years and find the point on that curve where it's the, the right optimum rate on average. And instead, of, so it's just like, okay, I put out nitrogen and this was the right rate. That's empirical. Mechanistic means what, what parts of the nitrogen requirement, you know, can we predict to, to figure out what that fertilizer rate is? So he said fertilizer is, uh, fertilizer is equal to the plant need, that total uptake requirement, minus what the soil gives us, divided by the efficiency of my fertilizer. If I surface apply urea in August, 50% of it's going to go off as, uh, you know, ammonia. And so we're going to look at that efficiency as being uh, 0.5, right? I have to double my fertilizer rate. And so it's, it's a very simple equation, but it gets complicated fast. And the reason this matters, and this was something that uh, I think Dale brought up right away in his, his presentation is, here's some, some data from Maryland. And we look at, here's an empirical nitrogen response curve, that blue line. We've got yield on that left vertical axis, nitrogen rate on that horizontal axis. And, uh, you know, the economic optimum yield was 173 bushels per acre at 205 pounds per acre of nitrogen. This was all pre-plant, no side dress. If they had side dressed it, they would have gotten a lot of efficiency and the right rate would have been, been a quite a bit lower. But all pre-plant. So 173 yield, 205 pounds to get there. But the max yield was different, right? So if, if production is our objective, I can get one more bushel with 25 more pounds of nitrogen. And I think that kind of like becomes clear that it didn't pay for itself, right? That's why that's not the economic rate or the economic yield. And it's because this is a diminishing return function, right? And so that difference of just one bushel, 25 pounds of nitrogen on farm is, um, as a farmer, we're not able to, to tell if we're over applying or under applying. Under applying, it's easier because you can see it. But if I'm over applying that 25 pounds, I don't know that I got plus or minus one bushel. I don't know if I have the right rate out there. But what they found was in the top meter post-harvest, they pulled soil samples and they, they saw in this top meter, so that orange line is soil nitrate in the top meter post-harvest and it increased 17 pounds per acre. So that's at-risk nitrogen. And that's what we hope our cover crops catch. They're not going to catch all of it. And so as we approach that economic optimum, we're starting to rapidly increase our environmental impact. And so the first kind of take home here is there's a disconnect between environmental performance and economic performance. So we're, we're performing a balancing act. And I, I talk to a lot of environmental groups as, a, as well as a lot of farmer groups. And, and those audiences have kind of different objectives. But we have to be really clear that there's always going to be some impact. There's going to be some residual soil nitrate. What we're really trying to do is put our best foot forward and kind of do the best we can to capture that nitrogen and not over apply. But we've got to understand there's no zero discharge. That doesn't exist. And so um, the way we've approached this is we've been doing some precision research because see, all the research we've done to date in nutrient management was to be more accurate. And I think we need to change our experiments and change our methodology to become more precise. And so, you know, we have this study, it's been going on for a few years in Illinois and Kentucky. Uh, this year, we had 57 different nitrogen rates between starter side dress, kind of split applied and uh, starter only rates also, because people are interested in that. At one farm, we had a cover crop. We had no cover, rye cover or rye plus clover. Look, when you mix that rye plus clover, how much bigger uh, the cover crop biomass is. And we had some really interesting results. And there was a lot of discussion from Tony and Dale about cover crops and nitrogen. And, you know, we did find that with that rye, we need to shift some of our nitrogen up front. It's not necessarily in every year that we need more nitrogen, but we've got to have that balance. So we're putting a little bit more up front. Now we weren't planting green, we were terminating the cover crop before we plant it. Um, but you can kind of see we had a pretty decent cover crop before we terminated it. And you've got to remember that half of the biomass you're generating with a cover crop, like the heavy weight that that rye is lifting is all below ground. Half of the biomass is below ground. So you've got all this carbon below ground that you grew, and that's going to immobilize nitrogen. So with our starter nitrogen, we're putting it down in the two by two. We're not broadcasting any. 
And so uh, it's a two by two band of nitrogen with these different rates going up to 55 pounds per acre in that two by two, 57 different nitrogen rates, free cover crops, a bunch of replications. That's 1,620 plots this year at one of those farms. And you look at that, it took us seven days of running a two row combine um, around the clock, basically to get that, that, um, that site harvested. And we did this at uh, seven sites this year. And so, you know, uh, we've had years where we had uh, over 2000 plots in a field. And the reason is, is because for each one of these rates that we assign to a plot, each plot has four splits. So within the plot, right there next to that nitrogen rate I assigned, I have a small subplot that got no nitrogen at all, starter only, starter and side dress or side dress only at every spot in the field. So I can look at the components of how I'm applying my nitrogen, where I'm getting the response. And the results are amazing. And we had uh, one field with white corn, which typically uh, yields a little less than yellow dent. And uh, we, were, we were knocking on 330 bushels per acre. And the interesting thing is in the good areas of that field, I can get 300 bushel corn with or without nitrogen, zero nitrogen. I was getting almost 300 bushel corn. And then in other areas of the field, I could get 300 bushel corn with 300 pounds of nitrogen. But without any nitrogen, I was only getting 100 bushel. So in one area of this field, I'm getting 200 bushels by adding nitrogen. And in another area, I'm getting zero pounds, zero bushels by adding nitrogen. But both of them, I had that potential to get up to 300 bushel corn. And when we look across all sites in years, this is yield versus nitrogen or economic return versus nitrogen. Look at the variability that's across cover crop sites, years. And so we've got to figure out how to get more precise. We're working on using sensors for nitrogen, like the Green Seeker that use an approach where we, as we travel across the field, it senses the crop and varies the rate every second. Um, there's a lot of problems with implementation of this technology, but the science behind it is very solid, where we apply a lower rate on the lower sensing areas, smaller plant, lower yield potential, kind of average areas of the field, we throw the juice to it more than probably standard. And then in the really good areas of the field, those areas where I got 300 bushels with no nitrogen, we're going to cut the rate way back. And the sensors let us find this. Uh, we're doing the same thing with phosphorus, but without the sensors where we're looking at just with or without phosphorus and very small plots shotgunned across the whole field. So these little plots with and without phosphorus, uh, each one of these points shows where we drop one of these in the field. And what we found is on average, our soil test recommendations work. On average, when you have really low soil test phosphorus, you need to add phosphorus. But in each spot, only 50% of the time did I need phosphorus. So when I go down to that plot level, this is precision. Our recommendations were accurate. We needed the phosphorus on average, flat rate the whole field, you were right. But when we went to each of those plots in the field, it only had a 50% chance of responding to that phosphorus fertilizer, even though the soil test was very low. And again, we see the same thing as with the nitrogen, where as that yield potential went up. So here we have the control yield on the horizontal. As it went up, the change in yield or the increase I got with fertilizer went down. Clearly there's a lot of noise, but this speaks to that soil health component. We started chasing the soil biology. It's clearly all related, but now our kind of working hypothesis and where we're working to go with this phosphorus uh, research. And I think also the nitrogen research is, I actually think it's soil depth and soil physical properties. Because what we think is, is that as that soil is deeper, at least for Kentucky, um, and, and we can get larger root exploration, then I need less fertilizer phosphorus, even at very low. Some of these have single digit soil tests and need it no fertilizer. And I think it's because the plant was able to get big roots out because the soil wasn't compacted or there was no restrictive layer down there. And so we're looking at ways to actually map uh, rooting potential. Can I make a prescription map based on soil physical properties that contribute to rooting potential. And that's where we're going now going forward over the next couple of years. So those are just a couple of really fast, quick points about some of the precision, the way I look at precision ag. Um, and it just, I was just spurned by what Tony and Dale said. So I threw out all my manure uh, slides, but if you wanna see them, we could get into them. There's a picture of me standing on, on some manure, uh, I think, which is what I did in the last five minutes. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll stop sharing my slides and um, I'm, I'm looking forward to today's conversation. Josh, thank you so much. Um, so um, I think we could like all have Josh go back through those slides again, because I'm like, I'm just, uh, there's so much data there and, and Josh is a fast talker for some of us Southern folks. So um, 
anyway, um, thank you so much for sharing that. And um, I appreciate you um, adjusting on the fly like that. I think you did very well. Um, I think what we're going to do now, we I'm looking at the number of folks that we have on. Um, and this is the time where we originally planned to have our breakouts. Erica, I'm going to um, send you for a loop here a little bit. We are going to not go to breakouts. Um, because I think we have few enough folks participating that, um, and I selfishly want to also hear more from Dale, Tony, and Josh, um, and also hear, maybe hear Dale and Tony ask questions of Josh and, and, and back and forth. So um, at this point, we usually would break out and have smaller groups, but um, I think we might get more benefit from um, just, um, just staying together and, and chatting. So if, um, if Dale and Tony, I'm going to give you guys the opportunity to jump in um, first. And if you all have any questions that, that you would like to throw at Josh or comments um, back on his presentation, I would um, let you do that right now. Yeah, like, well, like I said, like uh, what Phil was talking about, his his approach now to these testing is with, uh, you know, our, G, our um, we've got the capability now of getting more testing done out on farm a lot easier than doing all these small variable, you know, controlled uh, like Josh is doing. And I think if we can continue to get more out there on more farms uh, with our mappings and our, you know, all our descriptions and uh, yield monitors on the combines, we can get a lot more collective data if we can get more people involved, you know. So, so my opinion, if a farmer sees it on his own field, he's more likely gonna <clears throat> believe it. You know, uh, Josh is doing a great job and it's, uh, it's amazing. He's got so much information, it'll take a long time to decipher it. But if a farmer's got a, a lot of farmers in our area are using prescriptions and if they got a yield monitor their combine, if we could convince them to make these blocks, I think it, it would have a quicker impact on getting farmers of reducing their end where they don't really need to be putting it. I think that's a great point. If I can weigh in just for a real quick second there, uh, Tony, that's the number one thing Precision Ag has, has, has delivered us has, has been the ability for farmers to do this on-farm research. And all of our research is on-farm, that stuff I showed. But because we're trying to shrink the plot, that's why we're harvesting with our two-row plot combine, because we're trying to look at um, uh, changes in very short distances that a, that a, that a standard uh, combine can't handle. But you're, you're absolutely right. You've got to be doing this stuff on-farm. I want to jump in on here. So when when we're uh, we have some low nitrogen check blocks, and we've also got some high nitrogen check blocks. So we weren't just playing around with the low ones, uh, but we're playing around with some of the higher ones as well too. And there were about two, maybe two and a half acre blocks um, that we had. So you know we're playing around with that. And I guess I want to throw the question out: Is there are there any other advisors, crop advisors out there that have been doing this already? And what what do you have for experience? Uh, any feedback at all? I'd say for here in Arkansas, um, some of our soil specialists are, have got some post-season nitrate evaluation tools like the corn stalk nitrate test. It's been uh, evaluated for here and it's it's working pretty good. Some in-season um, plant tissue samples as well to check in-season status. Uh, and then like Josh mentioned, we're using um, using the Green Seeker technology as well. Um, we've got a really good soil nitrogen test for rice, flood irrigated rice in Arkansas. Um, but when you apply that to the upland crop, we still got a lot of questions to answer and kind of, you know, scratching our heads to get it to work in an upland crop. So we're still working on that. But, um, but I, I agree with what Josh was talking about. Variability is great in the field, um, and uh, I would agree that at least for P and K um, type responses, um, that soil physical structure is a big limiting factor here. Um, if we've only got a crop that's got six inch roots until we hit our hard pan, um, that's drastically affecting nutrient uptake. 
I'll just remind folks too, if you have questions for the speakers, if you um, want to type that into the chat box, we can also take questions that way. Um, we wanted to make sure that folks had access to all of our speakers um, because I would, um, would love to hear um, more, I guess, um, a lot of what I deal with a lot is manure. So I also wanna hear about um, how folks are utilizing manure more efficiently and, um, and, and maybe Dale and Tony, or, or Tony, if you're, um, if how you're handling manure storage when you're not um, able to apply when you want to or when you think you need to. Yeah, on our farm, we do have a manure storage, but it's only capable of three months capacity. But we utilize a lot of the covers. I when we usually do spread the manure, I surface apply. I don't inject. I never was a believer in injecting manure into the soil. You know, you need to let the microbes and the biology take this manure and, and uh, into the soil, I always felt. So we usually apply to cover crops. And then during the summer, we'll apply on alfalfa fields as we harvest. And uh, as you get to the fall, then we'll have covers and spread it on covers. And over the, you know, winter too, we put it on the covers, let the covers take it down. So it's, I think, beneficial on the manure side to have covers and let the covers, uh, you know, incorporate it and then... Uh, get into your system. So there is a, a question that's come up um, when conduct for, for in our speakers, both our speakers, um, when conducting infield trials, especially for nitrogen, what are some of the critical factors that should be measured with nitrogen? Soil moisture, compaction, et cetera. What are your thoughts on those? Well, some of it too, you know, it depends on what kind of cover crop when I'm using, you know, we're using cover crops here. You gotta, you know, your cover crops, you gotta determine what they can put back into your, to your uh, crops coming in. Because one of the things over the years was kind of interesting. I had an older brother that was never really, he always thought I was crazy doing this. He's a farmer too in that, but he always complained that our crops not looking real good early in the season. But then when August rolls around, all of a sudden he's saying, well, how come your crop looks so much better? And all the neighbors are all starting to, you know, burn up. And, the, and I said, well, that's our covers. Our covers are finally starting to break down and the plants are actually utilizing them in August and September when the, you know, when it needs the nutrients to fill the plant out. So, you know, the, the using of covers and knowing when it breaks down for your plan too, and not just, you know, waiting and trying to put on more nitrogen or something, thinking that you'll need it there. And then uh, that's, that's part of the problem we've got out there. Everybody's just too much applying nutrients in which we don't have to, we got to understand our soils and as far as getting your soil uh, in shape and, and bio, biology by bio, active bio, you know, biology in your soil is going to make a big difference on available nutrients in your soil and what's available to your plant. I want to ask you a question, Tony or Dale or both y'all. Um, this is Josh. Uh, so I'll, I'll tell a, a kind of funny story, but I'm going to leave names out to protect the guilty. Um, so a couple of years ago, I was I was uh, at another university giving a talk, and uh, I was kind of having a little debate with one of the extension specialists who had published a paper saying that plant and green, they saw real yield loss of crimson clover was involved, and and they so they published this paper, and and I. I'm sitting there shaking my head and I'm going, I don't, I don't see that. And that just that week, some farmers down in Maryland, who I used to do a lot of on-farm research with, and you mentioned what made me think of this was you mentioned uh, your brothers there. It's a group of brothers and the, and the younger one likes to do a lot of experiments. And he decided to do some planting green experiments with crimson clover. And, and he texted me this picture of, I mean, thigh high uh, clover and rye cover crop that he was getting ready to plant green into. And he said, Josh, do you have any advice? I said, man, you're, you're way past my abilities. I have no idea what you're going to do with that. And, uh, and I said, let me know how it goes. And then he texted me back. He said, you know, a couple of weeks later, he says, oh, we got a beautiful stand. It worked. It just worked great. And so when I was talking to this extension specialist at this other university, they said, you, can't, you know, you can't plant into, into crimson clover. I said, why? And they said, well, we weren't getting the fur to close up. And I said, well, why didn't you just adjust your down pressure? Just, just adjust the planter, right? She goes, well, farmers won't. And I was floored. And then that farmer from Maryland texted me back. And I said, I happened to be there talking to this person at the same time and said, everything went great. I said, what'd you do? And he said, I had to, I had to increase the down pressure. He's, he's running some precision gear. He said, I'd increase the down pressure 20%. And, and we had a beautiful stand. And so I, I wonder if you would just comment, since we got a lot of people on here about 
you know, how you have to make adjustments when you're farming the way you do. Well, I've noticed over the years, you know, I got started planting no-till in the, in the mid nineties with our crop consultant. He got me onto it. I, we could do it. And we were, we went into taking alfalfa fields out, you know, ever, ever since the mid nineties, I've never tilled an alfalfa field in my life. When it was taken out back then, it was no tilled corn into it and started in. So, and he got me going, he said, you got to go over two inches deep, you know, and back in the nineties, we weren't, you know, that was an inch deep, you know, early and then the inch and a half max, you know, and I'm going, no, we can't do that. I'm going nuts. He's no, no, keep going deeper, deeper, deeper. And, and a lot of the problems out there, I noticed over the years, even starting in the early 90s, when I was no-tilling, trying to get farmers to do this, they never got the seed in the ground. I went to one farmer, you know, he had it maybe three quarters of an inch, never got in the ground. He's saying, oh, that doesn't work. We can't do that. You know, you can't, doesn't work. No-till doesn't work and this and that. But planting into any kind of covers, you've got this mat and you've got roots in the ground. So you've got to get down two to three inches. You've got to get it in the moisture. Now, major the main problem out there all these years before that was nobody got it in the ground deep enough. And then they, they blamed everything else, but not planting depth and closing your furrow. So Dale, you had probably, you know, the newer planters, like we have hydraulic down pressure, so you can get the down pressure you need where maybe years ago you couldn't. So the down pressure is important. Sometimes you don't need any, sometimes you need a lot. Every field is different, but we had somebody in our area. I don't want to name names either that, would not plant green. He, they would always want to terminate first because they thought it was detrimental. And Tony convinced me to plant green and I'm a, now I'm a firm believer in it. Um, if you put the nitrogen up front, I don't think the rye is going to hurt you. But if you don't put nitrogen when you plant and you're planting green, then you may have an adverse effect. But I think if you put the nitrogen up front, I would, because if you don't plant green and you terminate and you get rained out and you don't get it planted, sometimes you're gonna have a real mess on your hands. And I think you're much better safer planting green than you are terminating and then having a, a problem down the road. Yeah. And, and we also know, it's also been proven fact, anytime you got a, a, when you plant your corn, one of the first uh, living roots that come out of a corn kernel will usually look for another living root in the ground and attach itself to it. And, and they share nutrients and mineral in the ground. So our theory of having, you know, this sterile or bare ground and planting corn into it is a myth because any, any type of plant out there will share nutrients with another plant. So having this cover crop out there and planting in the green, you've got the benefit and you've got your, your, your soil tilt is a lot better too also when you get into that. I'll let go of the same thing that Dale said. I mean, the new planters, uh, we just traded for one scut called Delta Force and it's hydraulic downforce. And you can actually adjust that on the fly in the cab. So it's not like you got to get out and, you know, change spring settings, which nobody used to like to do. I mean, it's yeah. a totally different ball game. You quite literally punch something on your screen and you can tell on your screen if your planter is down or not. And that doesn't mean you don't get out and look at it every once in a while, make sure that that you're planting deep enough, but but uh, it's a completely different ball game as long as you're willing to pay attention to what your monitor's showing you. And it's, it's really not that difficult to make changes on your planting, <laughs> but there, you know, the way you plant anymore. Adam, do you have other experience um, with cover crops or uh, are you doing that in, in some of your fields or you have yeah we're cover cropping quite a bit I mean I'm to the point where I'm trying to figure out you know how to scale up to the to the full operation I farm a wide range of soil so it kind of um, adds to the complexity a little bit from a you know heavy gumbo in the river bottom to sand knobs just outside the river bottom as it rolls up to the prairies soils but uh, uh, being set up to to uh, to farm that kind of diverse type of soils. I mean, it's kind of hard to figure out at first. I think everything's starting to come together on my farm. And, and, and the main part, the main part that you just, you have to start with, and this is my opinion, you're going to have uh, problems uh, like a no-till corn is you have to do that two by two or two by two by two. And it, that tillage addiction is basically a starter effect. You go in and you, you get those microbes or, uh, fired up. You get them consuming everything that that you're uh, 
basically providing the oxygen to to digest and that that tillage gives everybody just a little bit of starter so stop doing that and put a little bit of starter right next to the corn plant it'll it'll increase your yields and 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 it gives that it's the nitrate portion of your starter that uh, that's going to benefit your your young corn plants because the the microbes go after the ammonium so it's that you know, it's again, it's that it's the microbes and it puts it right in close proximity and gets it, uh, gets it going and it gives it something to feed on. So you don't get that, you know, that nasty looking cornfield right out of the gate. You give it something to go on. Um, so this is Amber. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I'm super echoey. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, I worked to really appreciate Dale and Tony and the innovation that they bring to the space and their um, willingness to jump on with nitrogen use efficiency with us when we were totally still figuring it out. Um, not that we haven't figured out now, but uh, really they were there for the beginning for sure. And Dale and Tony, I know you guys have been involved a little bit with like some of the new rules and things that are being proposed in Wisconsin as it relates to nitrogen. Um, obviously at Discovery Farms, we feel really strongly about teaching farmers how to evaluate these, these pieces on their own farm. And to me, one of the components of being able to evaluate this on your own farm is in response to the idea that there's gonna be regulation on these pieces. Um, do you see that this, like you guys are passionate about on-farm research and doing your own evaluations and, and continuing to grow that. Do you see that sort of um, coming true with other farmers? Like, are there other tools that could be provided to you to help facilitate this um, doing your own evaluation piece? Because as we go forward, I just think more farmers need to be in your spot of being able to, to do that continuous improvement. Yeah, well, we do, and with, with the technology we've got, you know, when I started to sell it in 99 uh, with the university, we well, we didn't have a yield monitor. I had one of the first yield monitors in the cab, but it was a lot of work to weigh everything and on each end of the field. We spent a lot of time with weigh wagons and that, but nowadays with our technology, a lot of these farmers just have to be willing to shut the planter off or not apply the nitrogen to certain areas or apply the fertilizer. And... Uh, you know, you can look at your yield maps and you're going to see it right away. And that's the only way, you know, a lot of them are going to, there I still, there's so many farmers out there who want to put that 250, 300 units of nitrogen out every year, a year. And they won't, and they say, well, we can't afford not to plant, you know, put a strip out there. But I think, you know, they need to be doing this. We, we got to be able to, willing to just, you know, back down an area and just see what we're putting on the table or what's, what we're leaving out there. So, well, Amber, I agree with you. It's very hard to get farmers to try this stuff. And I, I've seen it over and over. I know my, my crop advisor is trying to talk other farmers into doing it. And he's got a couple of them doing it. And I would really hate to see the nitrogen mandated on us. I mean, I don't think you'd like it either, but maybe if we mandated a farmer testing would be a better way of doing yeah. it. I don't know how we could do that, but that's a thought rather than actual mandating the use. It's going to come down to years and years of trial. So Dale's got five years. Tony's got more than that. It, uh, the growers themselves need to be feel comfortable about what it is they're doing. And and uh, one, you ain't going to do it. Two, you ain't going to do it. You really got to feel comfortable on the numbers that are coming off actually on your farm to really move those nitrogen levels down. If you know if that's where we're going. I've got to I've got to jump in and make a comment on something Dale just said. Uh, I spent a, a good portion of my career at Maryland, which is the most highly regulated in regards to nutrients in the United States. And so every farmer is required to have a nitrogen and phosphorus nutrient management plan and to have a license to apply nutrients. Everyone has to have a license to apply nutrients, fertilizer, or manure. And um, I always said, we saw significant movement for, we have over 80% cover crops in Maryland now on the ground. Now they pay for that. I mean, there's huge payments. People can make a lot of money planting cover crops in Maryland. So while there was high regulation, there was high investment to also help farmers meet that regulatory um, burden. Um, 
But I always said, and we, we, we have a lot of data that shows that nutrient balances improve significantly after passage of the rules in the late 90s. And I always said it wasn't the rules. It wasn't the limit on nitrogen and phosphorus rates. It was the education because the law mandated education because of the licensing. And if they had only done that and required, because right now we're preaching to the choir, we have about 40 people on here. And by virtue of them being on this call, they don't think they know everything, right? I mean, we all are learning every single day. I'm, I've learned so much in the last hour sitting here. And, and I think in Maryland, the biggest impact of the rules was requiring people to attend two or three of these events a year. And that's what changed. And farmers who I never thought, which people I grew up with, I grew up there, people I grew up with who fought those rules in court from day one say, Josh, I would never go back to the way I was 15 years ago as far as nutrient management. And it, it's just, and I think it's the edu education, but learning, we learn by doing. And some people just don't take that step on their own voluntarily. Yeah, okay. and that's where I think discovery... I got to give a lot of credit to Discovery Farms over the years. They were the one institution out there, and and uh, they did this farm farm testing. So in Wisconsin, here in Minnesota, Discovery Farms have been very very important. I think, and I say I agree with you. We need to get that out there. You know. I, I've got a question for for the farmers. Do you do you feel like the uh, financial lending institutions will play a role? and nutrient management in the future? Uh, yeah, we deal with uh, uh, our lender and she's been pretty good and she understands that, uh, you're, yeah, you're gonna have to have a lender that's gonna be willing to, to at least, and she's been very active in all our stuff too, that know what's going on with the farm side and, and by using covers and reducing our input costs and not maybe going after this this uh, yield, everybody wants to yield, yield, yield. These yield contests, for me, as far as I'm concerned, to be thrown out. We should not have yield contests at all. That should not be across the United States. We should not have yield contests. It should be, you know, rate of return. These yield contests are just killing. That. They're the reason we've got the problems out there, yield contests. So. Sometimes it's the same with dairies. I mean, if a dairy was struggling, a lot of times a lender would say, add more cows, add more cows. Well, to me, that's sometimes counterproductive and the same thing applies to cropping really where's that question coming from i mean wh why that question i mean i want to dig more into that question what what's behind i read that? a I, I read a paper i can't remember who wrote it but it was some type of institute uh that said that the the and it was really based on climate change that uh, a lot of lending uh, operations that deal with things that are dependent on the weather are becoming very concerned about climate change and what it may mean to their ability to lend. And this paper was focused on uh, on uh, how ag lenders uh, might fund what they were calling resiliency to climate change uh, in the future, that that might become a consideration. And it's way out there. But I didn't realize financial institutions and other sectors of the economy uh, were so concerned with climate change and their ability uh, to, to continue their business and, and mitigate the risk that they see. And of course, we've been doing that in agriculture from the inception, uh, mitigating all the risks that you can have. But I don't know if it's going to filter over or not. But that's where it's coming from. It's just that one paper. And I found that concept interesting that lenders might influence what we do someday based on some of these type of things. Okay, I've got a quick question for, for Josh and I guess, and Tony and Dale too. Um, you know, we've got a consultant here in Mississippi who's using learning blocks with some of his clients on farm. And before they get into the block trials, they um, separate the fields into management zones based on soil type and slope drainage, similar to, to what Dale's consultant was discussing about how he implemented the learning blocks. Um, Josh, do you think that that approach in separating fields by zone management before putting in the subplots would reduce your variability in that yield response? 
Yeah, so that's that's how we've started doing that nitrogen trial, and and our data from the phosphorus trial, where we're doing the very, looking at, at precision and phosphorus management, we stratify it by zones developed based on on landscape on topography. So I'm going to try and do this without taking up too much time. But precision ag, so there are literally hundreds of papers on green seeker sensors for variable rate nitrogen. So that's, that's what we call, it's a reactive approach to variable rate nitrogen. It's reacting to need expressed by the crop. Uh, it's more complicated than just like a leaf chlorophyll meter. It's not actually measuring green or nitrogen. It's measuring, it's predicting yield if I fertilize and yield if I don't. It's making two predictions every second, taking the difference. So how many bushels will I get if I fertilize? and multiplying by the an assumed nitrogen content in the grain. So that's how the green seeker works. It's a reactive approach that's predicting yield. And um, clearly a lot of that yield potential is, is driven by landscape position, soil depth, slope, aspect, elevation, right? Because of moisture in most cases, a lot of cases it's moisture. Um, and so there are literally hundreds of, of, of papers on green seeker and there's been almost zero adoption in a practical sense in the United States. It's a scientifically proven approach that no one uses, right? And so, so we need fewer soil scientists and we need more human scientists to help develop these tools so that they can be adopted. I don't think they're not adopted because farmers are dumb, right? No, it's because the tool wasn't built so that it could be adopted. And we need someone working to, to, to build that tool so that, so that it is adoptable. On the other side, Somewhere between 40 and 70% of the phosphor supply in the United States is applied variable rate. And we have no scientifically sound method to vary phosphors. There's no science behind variable rate phosphors because of that figure that I showed where soil tests alone is a 50-50 proposition being right. So I can have a spot in the field, soil test five, two spots, both soil test five. Totally need phosphorus according to soil test. One, I get 300 bushels with and without phosphorus. The other one, I get 250 with phosphorus, 100 without. That's the one I need to fertilize. Soil test, a coin flip is better than soil test at finding in-field variability for phosphorus. On average, soil test works. So if I'm going to do flat rate across the field, soil test is bulletproof. I take 20 samples in that field, follow the soil test guidance, and it's right. So I think it's landscape position. Zone management is complicated because it requires a lot of time and complexity you have to have someone who's going to be importing that data. I just got off the phone with a farmer last week. They're trying to figure out how to get geotiffs and SMS. They were on the phone with, with tech support all day long and, and figured out you can't, you can't take the geotiff into tech support, into SMS. You've got, to, you've got to grid that data out. You've got to take that image and create a point file and then take that point file and create a zone and take that zone and go back to a polygon. And we're not helping farmers get there to do this. So zone management is tough. Um, so that doesn't answer your question at all. But, but, but it's, but, you know, I mean, the point is, yes, I mean, we're taking, so we use MZA, which is a free software from ARS, the University of Missouri, and, and we use elevation aspect slope. And we're, we, we have also played with using soil texture, um, kind of estimated using various maps. And then we take those data layers and we compress them into a zone map. We keep it really simple. So a lot of times I only need two zones, maybe three, and then we stratify our treatments. So we take our plots and we block them by zone so that I make sure I have every one of those landscape zones in my research. And so I think if you're doing these on-farm test strips, you either need to make like zone out topography and make sure that your strips cross all of those zones. Or if you're using those postage stamps, make sure you put replicate postage stamps in each of those categories. You know, you might have three categories, one, two, and three, low, medium, and high slope, and make sure you've got four of your postage stamps in each one of those categories. Well, thank you, Josh, and um, thank you to everybody for this really great conversation. I don't want to um, stop the conversation, but I'm looking at the time and I want to respect everyone's time. Um, we have um, one last thing we'd like to do if Erica can get us ready. We have one more poll that we would like for you to complete for us. Um, and, and I just want to say while you're doing that, thank you so much for being here and being part of the conversation. Um, Josh, Tony and Dale, my goodness, thank you so much. I know all three of you are exceptionally busy um, with all of the responsibilities you all have. And so um, I just really appreciate you um, being here and spending some time with us today. I also wanna remind folks um, that, um, that we have two more 
of our events. And um, let's see if I can um, share our screen, my screen while you're polling without ending the poll, hopefully. Um, and just remind you that we will meet again in two weeks where we're gonna talk more about um, on-farm trials. So we've talked a lot about that today and um, it's just, you know, I think we can all see that that, that is certainly a priority and, and I respect greatly those farmers who are willing to do that and, and really interested in learning more. Josh, your comment about the education that was required for nutrient applications, um, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that, that the regulation itself in terms of how much you can apply, I think that gets a little um, iffy and, and, and I think folks are always um, a little hesitant to embrace more regulation, but more education, um, I just can't argue against that. Maybe that's the, the academic in me, um, but, but just learning more all the time, I think is a really good thing. So thank you for joining our virtual shop talk today. You can find more virtual shop talks on our website.